Well, uh, between last evening's and today's uh, dialogues, I feel full. <laughs> my mind, my soul feel full. Um, but if I'm being transparent, as we are promising to be here, it's also made me hungry um, for so much more uh, that seems possible beyond what we're currently doing. Um, it's like, I guess, after Thanksgiving when you eat a lot and then the next morning you wake up really hungry, you're like, how's that possible? <laughs> you stretched, you know? Uh, and so I think we've stretched a lot today um, and yesterday, and I think that's a good thing. I think we've learned what's possible. Um, so we're here to talk about ecosystems now, which really kind of, I suppose, uh, synthesizes all uh, other topics that we've spoken about as well. No pressure, panelists. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that's pressure on me. Um, and uh, I thought it might be helpful just to, you know, sometimes when I talk about ecosystems, my company is called Building Product Ecosystems. They'll kind of give me a quizzical look like ecosystems, products, how does that work? Uh, people think of nature appropriately. Um, but the definition of ecosystems is a, a large community of organisms linked together through balanced nutrient cycles and energy flows. So ecosystems are dynamic, um, they're responsive, they're synergistic, inherently healthy, and really there is no waste, or if there's waste, it gets optimized out pretty quickly, right? So, um, so we're here to talk about ecosystems uh, right now. So I chair the, uh, the Health Product Declaration Collaborative Board. I became very interested in transparency uh, in particular as it pertains to building material ingredients um, about 10 years ago when we found it was pretty hard to get uh, information on what we were building with. And um, we found that, you know, it not only nurtured our capability to optimize products, but um, transparency really deepened our relationships with our supply chains. Um, and really our recycling networks too, through just a deeper understanding of, of what we're currently working with and then where else we could go. So I think uh, um, that transparency that we're, um, that, we're, that we're talking about today, that's kind of an underlying uh, foundation for a lot of, a lot of these themes uh, that are so important to uh, better material cycles over time, um, it, it's really critical. So you see this orange line around all these images. Uh, that uh, is to represent a, a lens. And not all these images are beautiful. Um, and that's OK. It's where we're at right now. Uh, you know, I think uh, what we're trying to get to right now in order to uh, get to a place where we are more optimized, where we have more cyclical um, use of resources, um, just better re use of resources overall, requires that we acknowledge all of these different components of our current uh, way of taking and making and using and hopefully reusing wherever we can. And you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes these are actually beautiful pictures. I look at the, the pictures of the people, and I think all of those are actually beautiful, whether they're smiling or not, uh, because there's always so much potential in people, especially when they're working together. And so, um, you know, in some of these other photos of, uh, of houses, for instance, uh, completely submerged with uh, coal sludge, uh, for instance. Um, surpluses of resources that are going unused um, for lack of uh, maybe collaborative planning for the future. So it, it's incumbent upon all of us to uh, address and take responsibility for all of these things. And it's in a time where everybody is so busy right now, you know, I suppose it's good that uh, construction is booming and, you know, everybody's uh, busy, but it can be challenging to get the bandwidth uh, to really uh, consider all of these components that a lot of times are out of our view where we sit in our offices. So, uh, and a lot of times, you know, maybe clients aren't asking uh, 
uh, you know, architects to uh, really keep these, uh, some of these kind of disparate and, uh, you know, far away places in view. Uh, but it's, it's, it is our responsibility to do that, uh, whether we're asked to do it or not. It's, it's part of the picture. It's part of the supply chain. It's part of how we make so today, um, we're going to hear from a, a few different uh, really impressive members of our community. Uh, and you know, they're offering different perspectives on, um, on ecosystems and um, have different roles in these ecosystems. So uh, Franca, is, uh, Franca Tribbiano is going to speak with us first. Dr. Franca Tribbiano uh, is an associate professor in architecture at the University of Pennsylvania and a registered architect in Quebec. Her research on fossil fuels and the building industry and human health is uh, something that she's going to be talking about a lot today. Franca it has uh, written a couple of uh, really impressive books. I've gotten to read some of her research um, and have learned a lot from it already. Um, and um, so Franca is going to be really, you know, talking about the perspective of the um, the architect, uh, the professor, uh, the educator, um, and the researcher in this space. Um, after Franca, we're going to hear from Martha Lewis. Martha Lewis is uh, an architect. She's head of materials at Henning Larson, where she establishes strategies focusing on healthy, ethical, and environmentally tenable materials. Martha is currently involved in establishing a Danish Nordic material declaration and also was a member of the Buildings as Materials Bank's shareholders network. Um, and they're working on establishing an EU materials passport. And then after Martha, we are also going to hear from uh, Anthony Neron. And Anthony is an artist, a hemp ambassador, a biomaterial specialist, a designer, a visionary, and a builder. So Anthony grew up surrounded by beauty and design in his mother's boutiques and then um, really devoted uh, that kind of learning and understanding to kind of a transitioned um, application into construction, which is really interesting. So he began that training in 2005 and then founded his company in 2009. And um, Anthony works on assembling raw materials to make uh, effective products uh, really mostly focused on hempcrete and lime plasters, which you don't hear a lot about um, in an active practice today. And so I think it's really interesting to um, you know, hear about the, the challenges and the opportunities in that space with some of these materials, as we've spoken about in other panels, that um, maybe were used a lot more in the past and are having a, a somewhat of a resurgence. So, um, Martha, I mean, sorry, uh, Franca, come on up. <laughs> so just before we get started with um, our little 20-second um, video, I just want to take, oops, I just want to take the opportunity to thank John Sarah uh, and Allison for this uh, incredible uh, 24 hours uh, we're going on here. Um, it has uh, recentered, uh, reinvigorated, and re-inspired many of my questions in this field. So thank you so very, very much. The story begins with an explosion. The date was June 21st, 2019. It was daybreak. The sun had barely started its climb over Philadelphia. It was a special day, after all. It was nearly summer solstice. The one day of the year when uh, the sun has its longest performance and the sun has pride of place. And yet, it was the sun of a different kind that awoke the good citizens of Philadelphia on that uh, fated morning. A fireball of petroleum energy exploded at 4 a.m., sending into the dawn sky plumes of chemical smoke torching the contents of a storage tank that held 335,000 gallons of crude oil. Multiple explosions ensued, including in an alkalination unit uh, that uses the highly toxic and volatile hydrofluoric acid. 
propane and butane burned for hours. According to the city of Philadelphia uh, and its officials, the explosion posed no serious threat to the surrounding community as, quote, no ambient carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, or hydro hydrogen sulfide were measured in the air, end quote. Now, living immediately uh, north, uh, sorry, are we there? Yeah. Living immediately north, uh, less than two miles away, shaken out of bed, and being told to shelter in place, um, I was reassured that there was nothing serious to the surrounding, uh, nothing, you know, so, no serious uh, effects uh, for the surrounding community. At the break of dawn, the fire at the uh, oil refinery managed by Philadelphia Energy Solutions, the largest petroleum ref refinery uh, in the Northeast, was for the most part under control, we were told. Um, yet it was apparent to me for the very first time um, that this was the site where many of an, a good architectural plastic had begun its journey into being. The second story I share with you today is one of design, technology, innovation, and ecological aspirations. It's also a story of naivete and professional negligence mine. The year was 2007 and the goal was to build a net zero home whose energy production would hopefully be equal to, the, uh, to its energy expenditure. Cooking, heating, cooling, taking a shower, reading uh, in this house would not adversely uh, impact the world and contribute to additional CO2 emissions and of course uh, stave off climate change. All of the house's energetic needs would be taken care of by the solar power that was generated by the 27 cells which graced the house in the form of wings ready for flight. Um, Icarus Redux um, was the uh, interdisciplinary project that was uh, built as part of the Georgia Tech Solar Decathlon Home in 2007, whose main ambition was to maximize the amount of solar natural light that was channeled, stored, transmitted, and transformed into energy. Now, on the one hand, um, an aspirational project for sure, but on the other hand, it was highly misguided. Um, it was predicated on the adoption of plastics, 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 more plastics. Plastics on the outside, plastics on the inside. Plastics in the bedroom, plastics in the bathroom. Plastics on the facade and plastics on the roof. Gaskets, sealants, PEX tubing, panel laminates, cellular polycarbonates, polyacrylics, even nanoaerogels, ethylene tetrafluoroethylene. We could not get enough of the stuff. Sadly, it was not lost on me, even today, that our team won the British Petroleum Solar Award for Innovation. <laughs> of course we did. We excellently demonstrated the myriad of ways that one could continue to exploit petroleum in buildings, even if we succeeded in using the sun to displace the use of fossil fuels for powering the house. Tragically, in building this otherwise aspirational project, it never occurred to anyone on the design team that the use of so much plastic might do more to undermine the stability of the climate than the energy that was needed to actually take an extra long shower, which I happen to love. Never was fossil fuel depletion a factor in our choice of materials, nor was the risk of toxicity, waste, off-gassing, VOCs, and poor indoor air quality. We had, in fact, built a true Icarus. This time, however, his demise predicated on wings built of fossil fuels. Plastics, 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 yes. It's no secret that many of us love plastics. Indeed, the industry is addicted to them, and we heard this uh, last night as well. But what are they? All, all plastics share their origins in polymerization, the process by which molecules are combined and altered, typically from simple monomers into more complex polymers. The design and engineering of monomers is, in fact, uh, what conditions the material performance of polymers. Surely, one can use natural substances, and we've heard incredible, uh, incredibly inspiring uh, narratives today of using cellulose, and natural rubbers, and of course, even algae, um, to displace, potentially, the use of so many molecules in the making of building industry polymers. However, the greatest amount of polymers still today are made from fossil fuels. According to the uh, Center for International, International Environmental Law, nearly, quote, all plastic produced today, more than 99%, is manufactured from fossil fuel stocks, including natural gas liquids and the byproducts from crude oil refining. Building industry plastics, 
uh, and consumables will account for, as we heard uh, earlier today, for about 20% of global fossil fuel consumption by 2050. It's not surprising that the largest oil and gas companies are also in the business of supplying the raw materials for plastics. The, constru the construction industry is, of course, the second largest consumer of plastics in the US, consuming more than 12 million pounds per year. And through a process of uh, distillation, that thick, unsightly, and dark liquid that results from the smelting of raw coke, coal, ga coal gas, or crude oil, is magically turned into a versatile new substance. And of course, this proves, right, I'm sorry that it's difficult to read, but this is one of some of the chart lines of typical polymerization. Um, it's uh, turned into versatile new substances such as, and here we go, polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, polystyr polystyrene, polycarbonate, polyurethanes, polypropylene. Um, and these are just a few that are uh, kind of markers of the building industry. Um, and they're, of course, formed by a myriad of ways using lamination, injection molding, casting, extrusion, thermoforming, 3D printing. We get, we get the idea. They're super, super volatile. And we know that plastics come in one of three primary, primary types that we're using in the building industry. Uh, we're using our thermoplastics, uh, in which molecular bonds uh, are multiple but not cross-linked. These make the materials really soft and pliable, and they can be formed and formed almost at infinitum. And this is why architects love to use them in many of these um, signature projects, many of, some of which you know quite well. Um, we also have um, thermosets. And in this case, thermosets have bonds that are much stronger. And we'll probably hear more about this later on today. Uh, and in this case, these are physically stronger materials, but they're almost uh, impossible to recycle, as we'll see in a minute. And uh, these, we see some of these architectonic projects that are using thermosets. But then, of course, we have elastomers. And elastomers are typically rubber-based uh, compounds, such as silicone and neoprene and EPDM. And these, of course, rarely into the architect's design vocabulary, as they're typically invisible to the design eye. Yet they're ubiquitous, and these building elastomers are embedded in seams, fastening sandwich panels, composites. This is precisely what makes them so dangerous. So I'll say here that um, you know, plastics, we know, have a super intensive life cycle cost for us. And essentially, um, the carbon footprint of plastics continues to, even after we've disposed of them, grow. Dumping, incinerating, recycling, composting, all release carbon dioxide. In addition to that, we know that plastics are super high in embodied energy. And we know that uh, they happen to be the second highest in terms of weight for embodied energy um, right after um, aluminum. But the question is, and this is what gets debated all the time, is that at, at times plastics are argued as being really, really positive because they justify the relationship between operational and embodied energy. The total energy that's required to produce that PVC uh, polyvinyl chloride on the left-hand side is about half that required if that was a frame made out of aluminum. In addition, expanded polystyrene uh, insulation is set to return about 50, or, sorry, is set to return over a 50-year period 200 times the energy that was uh, consumed in its production. So it sounds like it should really all be a good deal um, for us to be using so many plastics, according to the industry. And we've all heard these stories before. But as we've heard again today, they do operate at levels of risk. And for us, the two risks, the two risks I want to talk about today that are interconnected are um, waste and human health. Now, the, environment, the environmental risk of not being able to recycle and or reuse most of these uh, materials um, is substantial when it comes to polymerizations. They're implanted in substances, they're transported via secondary materials, and often render assemblies impossible to disassemble. Uh, we know that this is the image in terms of our consumables, but we have a similar kind of image when it comes to building materials. Um, so as you can see here, it's very clearly that, in essence, um, thermoplastics are possibly recyclable. Um, thermostats are hardly ever recyclable, and so I'm going to assume that they're not recyclable, and elastomers are only partly uh, recyclable. The, re the result of which is we almost have about 100% of material waste, uh, which you know, creates um, new and alternative landscapes for us to consider. Um, how's that for topography? Now, Building-based polymers may be less expensive to produce and install, and they require less short-term maintenance, uh, and they may have better water and thermal performance when they're first installed. But the macabre beauty of this photo reveals, sorry, what, this macabre, what the macabre beauty of this photo reveals is that, quote, the falsely forever and materially inarticulate character of its building assemblies is something that we're going to live with forever. Crisp, shiny, and luminous when first extruded and manufactured, PVC siding and pipes begin to degrade, flake off, and break down almost immediately. And yet, while they are cheap to produce and poor quality, and they are poor in their quality of manufacturing, they persist forever. 
So the risks to human health of the perpetual presence of ever smaller uh, polymer particulates um, are substantial, and they have been already substantiated. Uh, polymers overrun our landfills and contaminate our soils. They break down into easily airborne part particulates uh, and into microplastics. Uh, they're even toxic during synthesis, manufacturing, and when ignited. Um, and of course, we've already heard today about the ways in which they contribute to asthma, eye irritation, and many of these um, symptoms. The case of PVC is pretty frightening. Uh, polyvin polyvinyl chloride is uh, incredibly versatile, and it's used in almost every single building material uh, that we have, from windows um, to gaskets. Um, but the PVC mono monomer is a known carcinogen that must be manipulated in closed systems to protect workers from exposures. And PVC is often plasticized or is made less rigid using um, chemical additives, which of course le leach into the environment. One of them happens to be phthalate plasticizers. Uh, and we know that they're proven endocrine disruptors. And not to mention uh, pose risks for reproductive health, Im immune response, and embryonic development, as we heard earlier today, for children, but not only for children, for all of us. Now, if PVC um, incineration it's not executed in accordance with environmental guidelines. The high chlorine content that results in the formation uh, of toxic carcinogens uh, produces dioxins um, in high concentrations, which of course can be um, lethal. And when plastics burn in uncontrolled building fires, the release of dioxins poses serious risks for firefighter, firefighters and others, a situation that of course the city knows incredibly well. But of course, the very materials uh, that are used to put out fires are killing us. Linda Birnbaum, the former director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, has spoken out against efforts to silence those who aim to communicate how, quote, industrial chemicals that have been used to make nonstick coatings that we heard about earlier today, firefighting foam, um, are basically killing us. Hence, um, whether through use, leaching, dispersal, or even burning, um, the accumulation of fossil fuel that's derived from plastics in our built environment um, and in our bodies must be an issue to the AEC, the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Um, I believe that there's no more uh, immediate threat um, to our um, survival. Speaking about survival, um, in 1954, Richard Neutra stated um, in his work, Survival Through Design, quote, for survival, we cannot always depend on our senses. They often fail to report danger in the smallest dose, which sometimes is the most dangerous. The fact that a man does not realize the harmfulness of a product or a design element in his surroundings does not mean that it is harmless. We need other more objective criteria than mere opinions or custom and habit. I guess Neutra was our canary in the coal mine. Um, this leads me to the project, Life Cycle um, Index of Human Health um, in Building. Um, what is needed is an integrated life cycle index for measuring the risk to human health posed by fossil fuel polymers. This is the work that we've begun at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and is funded by the Climate Center for Energy Policy. Fossil fuels, the building industry, and human health are roadmap to reducing the risks of toxicity in petroleum-based architectural plastics aims to design a building industry roadmap for decision-making uh, in the context of minimizing the risks associated with, with building-based polymers. Working alongside undergraduate and graduate students, the project involves um, these, oops, sorry, um, five, four criteria. It's hard to see this on the, um, it's okay. Um, first, data mining, which uh, basically tries to um, review existing life cycle. Oh, let me just read these through because I'm gonna go into them into uh, more detail. Um, data mining, assessment tools, professional education, and material disclosures. And we just talked about material disclosure um, in the introduction on the concept of transparency. So in the context of data mining, we're looking at a whole number of life cycle um, databases and evaluating the extent to which they do or do not include aspects of um, toxicity and, has and hazardousness related to um, materials. So whether we're looking at um, Ecovent, uh, many of um, us in this room have worked with some of these before, but primarily we're asking questions of, ooh, okay, um, Talk, uh, questions of toxicity. So Ecovent, Gabby, Tally, these are elements that we have in our environment. Um, assessment tools that we're um, looking at. Uh, many of us, again, have used these already. Uh, and I'm just going to, sh again, show you the content that the research project is looking at. 
Uh, whether we're looking at the Pharos uh, website, which is incredibly detailed and offers a lot of valuable information, the question is, how do these tools help us get to our roadmap? Or whether it's the well certification with its own incredible understanding of materials in its own um, you know, deep category of 11. Uh, again, another resource, the question is, how do we extract towards a roadmap? Um, and let me just move on to the third one. The question is the extent to which even our profession is already doing this. Uh, for that, I invite uh, our, uh, the audience to review the Perkins and Will Transparency website, which is a tremendous tool, particularly for product deployment and an understanding of the health risks relative to the products themselves that you may be wanting to specify. And here you can actually identify the levels of risk. Um, and of course, the environment that we're in today, we have to, often have to remind ourselves that the home that you're in is in fact uh, an incredible resource for this. Um, but I also want a, a shout out to the industry itself in terms of its own lack of transparency, whether it is from the, you know, from the top uh, to the bottom, increasing levels of transparency, we need to keep working on questions of MDS um, sheets, um, and also uh, questions of product declarations. And we've heard um, also uh, from Amanda, uh, the work that she's doing um, with the healthy product declaration. So the life cycle index that we're developing is trying to uh, map onto the existing life cycle for circular economies and for waste uh, and waste management, questions of human health. And as I zoom into here, you can begin to see how we're looking at these various categories that not only have to do with the stages themselves, exposure paths, but also the health impacts, allowing designers, engineers, and um, uh, builders to begin to evaluate where when that material is arriving to you does it have the most risk in terms of uh, the exposure path or the health impact. So in conclusion, so many of the health risk prone polymers that are used in the building industry are invisible to designers or they're embedded in other materials precisely because they are out of sight and hence out of mind uh, that we actually need to consider um, outright how many of these materials are impacting our human health. Now, this was the immediate context uh, of the fatally tragic Grenfell Tower fire in Kensington, London, that killed over 70 people. Uh, this event also propelled carcinogenic materials for nearly a mile. And why? Because the building was sheathed with fossil fuel polymer-based insulation for the purposes of reducing the consumption of fossil fuels. So um, many of these same materials are in fact produced in my backyard um, and the part of our project right now is looking at uh, how to map uh, the actual sources of these uh, petroleum um, plants. Uh, so not only are we actually uh, refining the petroleum, we're actually distributing it to these uh, producers uh, and we're trying to identify what the environmental conditions are around these plants and looking at the emissions around these plants. Should be no surprise that we're looking at um, uh, respiratory conditions and uh, cancer risks and of course we're not of course but we're mapping it to questions of um, environmental and social justice when we're looking at uh, populations um, that are um, under conditions of economic poverty and or uh, people of cover people of color and we're looking to see if there are correspondences with health health risks um, to where these uh, producers of um, plastics and polymers are located but the one map that I want to leave you with is this one this one is actually much more interesting. It's the solar energy projects in Philadelphia. Over the last four years, Philadelphia has become a hub for solar energy. And I hope that this map overtakes the other maps um, with time. Um, and I just leave you with this optimistic um, uh, vision of the view from my rooftop uh, with a wings of a different kind. Thank you. Hello, and thank you, John, Sarah, and Allison, for making this amazing event. And a huge thanks to the Healthy Materials Lab, the energy that's in that lab. You are an engine of radical change. I am an architect. I work at Henning Larson in Copenhagen. And for many years, I have been uh, speaking of the need for selecting our materials based on a holistic evaluation principle where we look at, of course, the aesthetics. We also look at the budget. That's always number one somehow. I, and we're always trying to fight for the aesthetics. But I try and make a very strong argument in the office that we need to, in addition to fulfilling code, our materials need to look at three other very important aspects. They need to take health implications, 
environmental implications and ethical implications into consideration as well. And in the recent year, I've been changing that terminology a bit to talk about, we need to look at the health implications and also the planetary health implications, not the environmental ones. Environmental is, it's, it's not close enough to our body. We need to make it closer. We make it, need to make it more visceral. So planetary health for me is a very nice way of uh, evaluating materials. I've also noticed in the last half year that there really is quite an acceleration in people's concern. And this is not just within the field, but in general, and I imagine that you also have noticed this. This is, uh, this is very important. This urgency, I hope, leads to change. Um, and this is an urgency that, that comes from, from this. In our field, uh, any architect in this room knows this statement. The construction industry is responsible for 30 to 40 percent of the global CO2 emissions. And uh, what I'd like you to do is take a look at that fifth word up there, responsible, and do a little professional soul searching, especially if you're an architect. I perhaps admit to yourself that we have actually been part of the problem over many years and not part of the solution. And that, for example, certifying buildings under any of the multiple building certification systems that are out there is, is providing minimal change. That is to say, we're doing things slightly less bad. And that's maybe not what's good enough or what's needed now. Uh, what has to happen in order for us to implement radical change what is that? I don't have the immediate answer, but I do know that knowledge is a good agent. Knowledge is a motivator. Diving deeper into these statements, construction materials, we heard this also this morning, contribute to 11% of CO2 emissions. Cement concrete are 8%, 3% for the rest of the materials. In the beginning of this year, the UN held a conference in Nairobi I, and at that point announced that the UN goals for 2020, the global goals uh, for reduction of chemicals, could not be achieved. Not only that, but that the global chemical usage will double from 2019 to 2030. The building sector uh, stands for a 28% of the global chemical usage. That makes the building sector the largest user on a revenue basis of chemicals. The, other, the, the next largest is the electronic industry, and that's half of this, so 14% of the usage. Agricultural pesticides, much smaller percentage. The health industry, also a much smaller percentage. Fashion industry, also much smaller. A study by the Danish EPA uh, looked at the actual usage of hazardous chemicals uh, in Danish building products and concluded that more than 14,000 tons were being used in Danish building products. I did a, a follow-up study on this looking at the data from 2016, and it doesn't look good. <laughs> We are, uh, have increased by 58%, so we have 22 and a half tons of hazardous chemicals in Danish building products. And these are hazardous chemicals that have been defined by the EU's chemical agency as being substances of very high concern and also being identified by the Danish EPA as uh, on, they're on the list of undesirable substances. Looking at another, uh, the other major humanitarian crisis, the, la the loss of biodiversity study from uh, Die Zeit indicated the 80% reduction in insect species over the last 20 to 30 years. Adding that together with uh, resource, in resource scarcity, uh, you have the burning platform. 
And now that I've banged you all collectively over the head with uh, the difficult status of our planetary ecosystem, um, what are the solutions for moving forward and for affecting disruptive, transformative, transformation in a change-resistant and risk-adverse industry? In order to tackle that one, I want to just dive into the detail level and explain a little bit about energy and a little bit about carbon that I think are essential in order to be able to move forward. We have opened our uh, New York office last year, and we have uh, work on multiple continents. The uh, drawings that I have on the screen on the left, there is a, uh, a detail and a facade detail from the University of Cincinnati Business School. This fulfills the energy requirements for lead gold, and we have a, a total of four and a half inches of insulation. For a similar office building in Copenhagen, I, on the drawing boards in 2015, where we had to fulfill the Danish building code, we have nearly double, uh, eight inches of insulation. Uh, and that is simply fulfilling the building code. We're at very different places in Northern Europe and in the US. A little bit more about the background of this. Uh, in 1961, Denmark, uh, established the first regulations for energy use in the building code. And they have progressively been tightening those requirements over the last 60 years. So that in 2020, we are very close to zero energy use, which means that our operational energy use in, a, in buildings is actually very low. Looking at the second diagram here, I'm looking at carbon emissions, which are now much, much more relevant for us in Northern Europe to be looking at, because as you can see in the red line, which indicates operational uh, carbon emissions, over 80 years of this office building's life, the projection is that uh, the carbon emission is actually a little bit more than half of the carbon emissions needed to establish this building. So that's why our focus has to be on uh, the, the embodied carbon in building materials. So it's another way of saying that materials actually are, are the crux of the problem. They are also, they're also the key to the solution. And what we need to do as architects is we need to have a thorough knowledge of the embedded carbon in the materials that we're choosing. We also need to look at the hazardous chemical content, and we need to be very aware of the implications for biodiversity. We were uh, lucky enough this year to have a fabulous case to test some of these uh, challenges and to see if we couldn't address them in a very thorough manner. The case is a small school in Jutland. It is a pilot project, and here we have the architect, Maunus, the uh, constructing architect, Peter, and an innovator, uh, Lars Keller, who is uh, connected to the uh, client group. He's a parent of a child at the school, and he is also a building supply uh, material man who has revolutionary ideas about what we need to do in order to reduce our carbon usage. For this project, uh, we realized that it was a key pilot project, and we've developed five dogmas for uh, the project. It's a very small extension with very ambitious goals. It's a half million US dollars, uh, 2,500 square feet. There are two classrooms in there with a social space in between. Uh, it's a private client who has very high ambitions, which is key. The uh, client would also like the project to be used as part of the educational material. And uh, there's a very active engagement and involvement from the parents. This is the, the plan. We have uh, the existing uh, school building on the left. The new addition is in the red circle. And there's an existing small warehouse on the right. So it's a very small piece of land. 
I, and this is the plan, working with the laboratory, the lounge, and the classroom, all connected to the uh, playground space. And our challenge as for, for our office is how can we implement these fabulous uh, f uh, five new dogmas in this project while maintaining a very high quality of architecture that we are known for. The materials we're using on the project are a straw element uh, that is in, in pine timbered and delivered on site uh, pre-cut to the, the exact sizes with the window openings, etc. There is uh, wood fiber insulation used as a wind uh, barrier and additional insulation. Uh, we have a moisture barrier uh, used on the, gray, uh, the slab at grade and also on the uh, roofing in order to avoid a PVC membrane. The cladding uh, is spruce, untreated natural spruce. The uh, windows will, are wooden windows. The uh, interior rendering on the outer walls is a clay rendering. The ceiling panels are a concrete wood fiberboard. The flooring is a tile flooring and uh, a wood flooring that is a, using the scraps from a very high-end uh, wood uh, plank company. Five dogmas, uh, one, two, three, four, five. I'll take them one by one in detail here. We are looking at optimizing biomass in the construction because this is the way to sequester CO2. And we are using materials that grow rapidly. It's a renewable source. It's a no-brainer, and it has an instant impact on the CO2 in the atmosphere. I, we are also very interested in, in measuring and in documenting uh, what our, this building is doing. This uh, is a CO2 comparison from the previous school that Lars built with his Echo Cocoon uh, straw units. This is not directly connected to this school, but it's been a, a motivator for us because all of the green uh, is from the previous school built with organic materials, and all of the red is from a reference building, a standard built with standard Danish materials. And uh, just to point a little bit here, I'm going to explain and then walk over. There's a zero line, and above that zero line is all the carbon dioxide that is admitted in the material production, and below that line is the carbon dioxide that's sequestered. So on a building component level, here's the line. On the uh, building level, here's the line, yeah. The, <laughs> the uh, reference building is admitting 112 tons of CO2 in creating the reference building. The uh, organic building is sequestering 32 tons of carbon dioxide. This is what we need to be doing. The second dogma is designed for disassembly. Mechanical connections, units that can be um, mounted and demounted, they can be replaced should they need to be replaced. They can also be reused if they have a value at the end of their life. We are trying in every detail of this project to avoid glue or, and trying to work very clearly with um, mechanical connections or entire units that are perhaps built up of multiple layers that can be used as an entire unit in their next life. Um, so simple design principles for the reuse of building components in the future. Dogma number three is that it's, it's essential that we have a good indoor climate. And that means natural ventilation and optimization of the building glass area to avoid overheating. We are also uh, trying very hard to work with uh, no vapor barrier. And for many years, people in Denmark have been talking about, well, we build these great homes, and then we put a plastic bag around them, and we're all living inside plastic bags. And of course, even just saying that uh, makes people get a little bit nervous. So we're working uh, with wind, wind barrier and a moisture barrier to try and avoid putting in the plastic layer, and also to improve the, uh, the potential for carbon uh, sequester. The dogma number four is that we are working free of 
chemicals or as free of chemicals as we can be within the confines of the existing industry. Uh, so we, this, this, this has multiple impacts. We're optimizing the indoor air climate in terms of minimizing off-gassing. Uh, and uh, we are trying to uh, improve the health for workers in the production phase and in processing methods. Uh, as Laura said this morning, there's a whopping amount of chemicals that these workers are exposed to. So by choosing toxic-free products, we are also looking all the way along the, the supply chain. And we're also, that also has an impact on the end of life of, of these materials. So if we use them again, our, we're not carrying the toxics on to another uh, uh, population. The very last dogma is uh, reuse of local materials. Uh, in the case of the school, uh, we are using previously produced materials, and this saves resources and energy. Uh, in this very specific case, there's an existing brick wall that needs to be torn down in order for the uh, addition to come up. And we have some very willing and involved parents who are involved in this demolition and the rinsing of the bricks. The bricks will be reused in the foundation detail. Uh, which you can see is still on the drawing, drafting boards, and they're trying to work out exactly how to, how to do the, the foundation details. Uh, so those are the five dogma, uh, with a very important reuse of biomass, uh, designed for disassembly, good indoor climate, free of toxic chemicals, and the reuse of local materials. Thank you. Hi everyone, so you like design, you like uh, architecture, I guess. Thank you so much, we have a beautiful crowd. So um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be the, the cherry on your Sunday. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Société du Chanvre, Quebec, and Canada, established in Quebec. So you know my first language is French, so forgive me for the translation. Société du Chanvre is the um, education part of our work. Uh, half of our work is um, construction, so most of my time is spent on the construction side. The other part of my work is uh, education. So I um, very early on I took this uh, responsibility very uh, seriously. You know, you you uh, you can't just come and put something uh, on the market and hope for the best. You know, if you uh, if you bring something new. Edu education has to come with it, so um, uh, lectures, conference, uh, consultation, but also um, uh, training programs, workshops. So we have Société du Chanvre, we have um, uh, Du Chanvre uh, interior design, we have Du Chanvre construction and supply. So hempcrete and uh, lime plasters building materials for uh, insulation and finishing. So what is, uh, what is hempcrete? Hempcrete is um, um, uh, two words, hemp, of course, you know the plant. Chanvre is the French word for, for hemp. And uh, also comes from concrete. Concrete, uh, which means uh, a symbol of um, aggregates and binders. So hempcrete is, the binder is lime, the um, aggregates are um, uh, the hemp herd. So it's basically, it's the Roman concrete that we've substituted the, um, the sand to uh, hemp herd. So hemp herd is bringing the insulation value to the material. Lime plasters been using, uh, we, uh, lime plasters have been used, you know, for um, uh, many, many centuries. You know, it, it, so hempcrete, lime plasters is uh, like, traditions in a modern way. It's something new, but you know, it's, 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 it comes from an ancient science. It's, you know, being passed on from craftsmen to craftsmen, from artisans to uh, artisans. Here we have the hempcrete uh, cast in place. So the materials are br brought on site, all the equipment, the, the material is being uh, produced on site and cast into the, the formwork. This is the, um, what we call the, the grand art, you know, because it's, it's like 
it's not like making little molds and we're molding the whole house. So the whole house is one piece of a hempcrete. It acts as a um, you know, uniform monolithic envelope. Requires quite a good team. You know, we need to be at, at least like seven workers to, uh, to keep up the rhythm of the cast in place hempcrete. We're going layers by layers. So it's, um, um, it's a teamwork, it's very rhythmic. We're uh, rising all the walls of the, um, uh, the building at once and working fresh on fresh, you know? So it, 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 everything bonds together, it's only one piece. It's very uh, efficient, you know? It's the form of hempcrete uh, who has like uh, no, um, no joints, no, um, um, well, there is, there is this homogeneous uh, envelope that uh, creates uh, something very, uh, very efficient, you know? We also have the, the hempcrete blocks, which is the, high-quality prefab version of hempcrete. Hempcrete can also be, uh, be sprayed, but hempcrete blocks is, um, is, uh, has a very good uh, quality, you know, just like, um, just like the, the cast in place. It's very um, solid. We use the hempcrete blocks to, um, to, to build a little uh, faster because you don't have the drying time. Of course, the cast-in-place hempcrete has to dry bef before we, uh, we do the lime plasters, the finishings. So hempcrete blocks, we use, them to, um, we use them for insulation. You know hempcrete is an insulation system. We also use it to, uh, to build the walls. If they're not load-bearing walls, we use the hempcrete blocks for, for the construction. So it's a very, um, a very good support for the lime plasters. Once the lamp plasters are done, you have a one-piece wall. It has the same um, uh, efficiency as the, the, um, the cast in place, but is, uh, is a different spirit. You know, it's something um, that, is, uh, that is done, you know, more, um, uh, more, more quickly, but once you have the lamp plasters on it, you, you get the same results. What are the benefits of using hempcrete? What are the benefits of using uh, lime plasters? Well, first of all, it's about the performances. It offers superior performances than conventional materials. Talking about the insulation system. So, of course, um, the performances of hempcrete is about thermal resistance. The R value of the hempcrete is R2.1, 2.1 per, uh, per inch. And we're, um, you know, we're doing most of the time 12-inch thick walls, so we get uh, R25. So this is the question we're always being asked. You know, what is the R value because it's an insulation system, but you have to look it, at, you know, as a, a, a global performance. There are no comparable on the on the market to hempcrete because hempcrete is masonry. You know, it's a si uh, insulation system that is masonry. What makes it masonry is the, is the binder we're using, is the lime. So this is how we are equipped. You know, we're equipped as, a, as, as, as carpenters, you know, for the farm work, but most of our equipment is um, uh, mason equipment. What is, very, um, what is very interesting about hempcrete is that it has um, a thermal uh, inertia. So, is also, it's in between insulation and thermal mass. So it, it, it has both uh, advantages. Thermal mass will, you know, temperature will build up in the wall, whether it's, it's heat or cold, and it will be slowly irradiate. So it goes very well with houses that have a radiant uh, type of heating. So the walls are, you know, a bit conductive, so the, um, the temperature builds up in the wall. They're um, very, uh, very comfortable. You feel, like, you feel like you're being enveloped by the wall. You're more comfortable in a room at 15 degrees with, when the wall is at 20 degrees than the opposite. Even if the, the temperature is 20 in your room, but the wall is cold, it's, it's 15, 
that's what you're going to feel. You're going to feel the walls. So having thermal mass in your building is, uh, is, is very comfortable. So you know that thermal mass will stabilize the temperature. You won't have, uh, you won't have fluctuation in, in the temperature. Thermal reflection is very, um, very useful when it comes to energy efficiency. Thermal reflection is the capacity of the wall to reflect the temperature, you know, inside temperature, outside temperature. Works on both sides. The lime plasters will amplify this, uh, um, this uh, phenomenon. Especially for insulating roofs, you know, um, sometimes when uh, houses get very hot in the, uh, warm temperature, it's coming from the roof because the sun is tapping on, the, on, on this, the, the roof and heat will slowly come in, even if you have a lot of insulation. But if you have a reflection factor in your material, this is going to, to, uh, to block like um, very high temperature in, in, warm, temp in warm climate. So thermal reflection, you know, it comes with the lime plasters because of the sand we're using, but it also comes from the hemp herd. Hemp herd is very uh, mineral, you know, it has very high level of, of silica, so it reflects light and reflects temperature. So through the whole wall, you have this reflection factor that is slowly working. Humidi humidity management is, um, is, is a big thing in uh, efficiency, you know, energy efficiency, because hempcrete is uh, managing humidity. It's microporous, so it's taking in humidity and releasing it depending on, on the, um, the, uh, the atmosphere, on the humidity levels. Hempcrete homes are uh, slightly more dry than conventional homes because the lime is very thirsty and the, the herd is very porous, so it, you know, it runs through. Very, uh, it's much easier to control temperature when it's, it, it's drier, so easier to heat and more comfortable. Air tightness is very important for efficiency. If you have heard of, of passive house, passive house are, are uh, very airtight. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a way to control temperature, of course. Hair doesn't pass through uh, lime plasters, but humidity uh, does. So in the wall, there is no vapor barrier. Humidity goes through. This is a new concept that uh, modern building codes have not um, uh, assimilated yet, especially uh, in Quebec. We, are, we have very high humidity in our country. We try to fight against it. We, want, we don't want humidity in the house. We try to, uh, to control that. But what happens is that it gets in anyway. It, it gets in through um, you know, the, the, um, any uh, failures that could have been you know, done in the construction. When water goes in and there's plastic in the walls everywhere, vapor barriers, what happens is that it deteriorates because it goes in and can go out. And we're producing a lot of humidity in our buildings you know, by living in it and everything. So it's better to, um, to plan to deal with humidity instead of trying to fight it because it's everywhere. It, it, it's always going to be there. You know, people working in renovation, refurbishing, they know that because they're, sometimes they are redoing, refurbishing things that they've done like 20, 30 years ago. So it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a real problem, you know, to try to fight against humidity, but now we have discovered that not only it's not a problem if we have humidity in our walls, in our buildings, but it's also useful <laughs> because, um, yeah, let's talk about efficiency in seasons. You know, there are phase uh, changes of water in the hemcrete wall, in the walls. What happens is that you're going to start the winter with a very dry wall. So humidity, you, you know, you close the windows, you start heating the, the, the building. So humidity will build up in the wall because it's very dry from last summer. What happens is that the water gets in the micropores of the herd and, 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 um, and the binder, the lime, and gets into the nanopores and there it, it's going to condense. It's going to change phase. It's, it's passing from vapor to water. 
this, um, this change of phase is producing heat. So your hemcrete wall in, in, in the, the winter will produce a little bit of heat, which uh, will, will uh, compensate because it's going to lose a little bit of R value. If the humidity rises in the wall, you're going to lose a, a little bit of R value because water is conductive. But what happens is that this phenomenon, uh, this, um, this change of, of, of phase, is, putting, uh, is, is giving more heat and, and, and compensate for this, uh, this R value loss. And the summertime is the opposite. So your wall is going to dry as it goes back to vapor. It's, 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 uh, it's going to, um, to ab absorb the heat. And the, the wall, they feel fresh in the summertime. So hempcrete homes are comfortable you know, all year long. And it's, you know, the fact that it's hempcrete, is, uh, hempcrete building systems are, are rising in warm temperature as well is, um, is a proof that it's, it, it's working very well. You know, it's, it's, it's growing big. In, um, in, in Europe, you know, it's coming from France, it's in Belgium, in Germany, in Switzerland it's big. It's, it, it's, also, it's also going very well in Australia and growing in Morocco. So there are hempcrete buildings, you know, all over the world and they are perfor performing very well in every climate. So second big, you know, a very important benefit from, from building with hemcrete and lime plasters is the aesthetic. You know, this is what most of the people are looking for, you know, when they, uh, they, uh, they come to choose um, uh, building material. Architecture. Hemcrete, lime plasters, they can fit in every type of architecture, whether you go like traditional or you want to build uh, contemporary, you, you want to build, you know, more um, roots. When I started, I, I've learned hempcrete. It was more uh, rustic type of buildings, you know, um, not, uh, not always very uh, precise. And uh, so people closer from nature uh, used to build with, uh, with hempcrete. My goal was to uplift the standards. I wanted to. I wanted it to be part of the solution. I wanted hempcrete to be a true solution, and you know, rustic type of architecture uh, only fits to a, a small portion of the of of the market of the consumers. So we brought it, you know, into a contemporary. We have new design currents coming over that are very interesting, like minimalist and very uh, mineral and very, um, you know, it's very um, artistic. We want to go like monolithic. So we fit perfectly in those design currents. It's a good thing that these design currents are rising because they fit with our products, our techniques. They fit with sustainability. You know, so we're trying to bring like more substance to those design currents. We want something that will last. We want like timeless building. So it, it, it's very important that those new design currents, they come with more something, substance, you know. They come with, uh, with more, you know, truthful solution. We use noble materials. What we use is we're using the hemp, we're using sand, we're using lime, stone, we're using wood. What we're trying to do is we want to introduce, you know, more of those noble materials in the bindling. Okay, thank you. Because, like, we want to inspire noble living. So we have the shapes, we have the new, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of different finishes. I'm going to show you, you're going to have a, a, few, um, a few pictures of the, the projects we've done lately. So lime plasters, they're very soft, you know, there are the kind of uh, finishes you want to touch. They feel good, they, uh, they look good, there's a lot of depth and transparency that comes with the lime. Lime is, is, is a little bit transparent. Most of the, the, the finishes is, is being like, 
it, 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 it comes from a mix of lime, comes from a mix of sand, and you can see the sand in the, in the finishes. It's, you, you can, you know, you can feel it. These are the, the uh, materials that have been around forever, you know, so they're very balanced, they're neutral, they're compatible with our, you know, bio energy. So we start from the hempcrete, very raw, and you know you have the you know the base coats, and we can go finer and finer, and get to the Venetian stucco, marmorinos. We do a lot of of, of bathrooms and wet areas because lime is uh, is uh, antifungus, antiseptical. So it's the binder we're using, but it's also like treating the um, the vegetal body, you know, to make it last. A lot of um, a lot when you think of you know masonry. You think of, of of bricks. You have to go with mineral type of of um, of, of finishing, mineral type of treatment, like unless uh, unlike uh, conventional paints. Sustainability is very um, is very important when it comes to choosing building materials. So carbon negative, that's what Mcrete is. Not only we have to stop polluting, but we have to clean the earth. You know, there's a lot of, uh, of carbon to take out of the atmosphere. 44% of the vegetal body of the, the, the hemp is carbon taken from the atmosphere. So one ton of hemp growing is capturing 1.6 ton of CO2, of course, releasing the, the oxygen. So. Average size house is, uh, can produce up to 16 uh, tons of, uh, of, of uh, carbon in the air. Yeah. The only way that this carbon can go back in the atmosphere if it burns or it decays. But hempcrete, lime plasters, they resist fire, they resist humidity, vermin, compaction, and, and movement. So they're you know, very durable, and it's a long-term solution for stocking the, um, the carbon. It's earth, worker, and dweller friendly. You know, we, if we're using the materials that are our, our, our feet, we're just reorganizing, uh, reorganizing those, uh, those elements. So it's not harmful neither for the, for the earth, the worker, or the, the occupants of the building. Quality means durability. It has to be. Uh, it has to come along with, you know, skillful um, uh, practices. So hemp is fiber. Energy is the number one medicine. Is the number one food, and the number one building material. We promote uh, hemp as much as, you know, as much as hempcrete. It's also, you know, it's a revolution for, uh, for. Agriculture, it's a revolution in the construction industry, very generous resource that is coming up. So I'm out of time, you know, but I'm, I'm just going like, to go very uh, quickly on, on those challenges. Education is a big challenge. We have to teach because it's something new, of course. Certification and building codes, we have to go through a lot of work for that. Because the building codes are not set to, uh, to welcome hempcrete because it's, it's, um, it's new, it's not, um, it's not been part of, of enough uh, resource, uh, research. It has proven itself, you know, on the field here. Uh, we have over like 200 projects, but we don't have the certifications yet. There are certifications in France and Belgium, but they're not accepted on our, in, in our country. Still doing the work, still, um, still being, uh, you know, we are able to do so because it's uh, for the, for the, you know, for the people, for the owners, it's their property; they can use it. But architects, it's hard for them to put them in the plans. We're doing, uh, we're doing a lot of work, like, 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 like today. Maybe Parsons should have a, a hemp department <laughs> to work on it. Maybe. Uh, yeah, of course, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's by talking about it, it's by doing beautiful projects that we're making a lot of ways, a uh, lot of waves, you know, sending this message. So that's, um, yeah, that's our presentation, thank you.
Thank you, everybody. So as each of you are uh, very deeply considering ecosystems, obviously, in, in your work, um, I'm wondering if you guys can speak to the role of place and locality and, um, you know, do you see building material sourcing uh, returning to more localized and less globalized supply chains? Martha, do you want to start? Mike is on. Yes, it is. <laughs> I think that uh, working local is is key, and and yes, uh, it's it's essential for the building supply to have more focus on 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 a shorter a, a shorter distance in the loop. Um, yeah. Franca. Oh, thank you, Martha. Um, I'd have to say that the, I guess in a way, working on this research in Philadelphia um, is working locally at a research level to try to understand maybe not so much the incredible sort of positive and uh, kind of um, perspective, uh, you know, practices and ideas that we've had um, in the second and third presentation, but at least trying to understand what are the risks and ways to mitigate the risk at a local level. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that the refinery is right now in some pretty serious negotiations with the city because naturally the inhabitants that are much closer than I was want the refinery to close and they've been working at trying to close this refinery for decades. Um, hopefully there will be enough local empowerment to be able to suggest that there's a much better use for that number of acreage in southwest Philadelphia which would be an awesome solar farm, I keep saying, um, because after all, the land is incredibly contaminated and can't, you can't really do very much with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I do hope that even with respect to criticism and critique and um, a kind of a critical engagement that we really do start locally. Mm -hmm. And Anthony. Yeah, we, we, use, <laughs> sorry. we use as much local material as we can, like the sand is very local, lime is local, hemp is, is, is a little harder. We're not afraid to, to import, you know, most of the hemp, I get it from France or Belgium, the Netherlands. They're producing a lot, they are, um, the industry is well set up, it's not the same here. Two decortication plants have uh, been uh, s set up last year near my, uh, my hometown. So it, it, it's, it's getting there, but we need, you know, we need to, um, to show a good example for the industry to set up. We need all the, um, uh, the pieces of the chain you know, for, for it to work. So from the farmers to the processors, industrial, to uh, the workers and the um, educated public, you know, all the, the, every, everyone has to be there. But for it to happen, we have to see what we can do. You know, we have to show the example. So importing is just a matter of time that we won't have to do it, you know, in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, in all of your work, Martha, you were mentioning that it's really critical to have an engagement from a savvy owner. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, surely there's lots of instances of owners um, not understanding all of these possibilities maybe. And so how do you help them uh, really see this whole system of impacts but also opportunities? And what metrics are you all using? I know, um, Franca, you in particular, and uh, Martha, you to some extent too, spoke about some of the, the metrics. What have you found to be most compelling maybe in um, convincing uh, you know, a client that might not be on board originally uh, to really engage with wanting um, something that, you know, materials that really respect the whole system and nurture the whole system. Yes, that's uh, very true that even in practice, we have a huge uh, educational role where we uh, are teaching the clients and informing and sharing the knowledge that we have because knowledge is this accelerator and if you can show a client, for example, if we did the building like this with this structural material, you would 
be admitting so much CO2. If we did it with a hybrid construction with glue lamb, uh, you would be actually right, right around CO2 neutral. And then if you did a complete massive timber building, you would be sequestering. So we work a lot with uh, material matrices. So we show not just uh, take CO2 into that matrix, but also take all of the other aspects that are relevant for the client. Um, and one of these is very, an important one is the indoor air. So we evaluate that on the three different buildings with the different materials, and we'll have uh, you know thumbs up and thumbs down for other parameters as well, including cost and including time. How long does it take to build? Do you have any savings in cost if, if your building is quicker? And putting this on one page, all of the different parameters that we know the client has an interest in, and then the different solutions, this is uh, the best way to move forward for, for us. And you, you teach a lot in the process. So a lot of comparison. Yeah. OK. And Franco, what do you see being next on that front, too? Well, so um, in regards to the question of client, I, I see the client of this work being um, professionals, necessarily, um, architecture, engineering, construction professionals, and students. And I think that the question of what the metric would be um, it's something that has been dogging me for uh, a couple of months working on this project because one of the things that I didn't have the chance to say is that actually so much of the data and so much of the work that we're doing on these various um, evaluation tools and um, online systems are really daunting for a lot of professionals and certainly for students. Uh, there's an incredible amount of knowledge that one needs even to begin. How do you choose which of the certification systems is better? Which one is more competitive when you're going to actually um, use it as part of your uh, product uh, of services that you might offer to your clients? So there really isn't a roadmap for making the decisions clear to yourself and to your future clients as to which way one would head if one's trying to identify a range of healthy material choices in your building design. And so the roadmap, uh, similar to a roadmap that I had designed relative to energy efficiency for retrofits, is really a, a tool to help the decision-making process of the designer. Um, metrics are important, but they're not the goal. It's the value system against which the hierarchy of decision-making uh, is to be set. And that's a little bit of a different um, activity than uh, using metrics alone. So it's metrics value in a process of decision making. Mm -hmm. OK, great. And can you say a little bit, um, Anthony, about it, the education that you do with regard to all of this um, in that component of um, your business? Yeah, of course, if, if the first criteria the people are are looking at for choosing a building material is performances, metrics are very important, you know, but it was so, we're sharing a lot of information coming from, uh, from Belgium and France. They have a lot of documentation, they have a lot of, um, they have the certifications. It's part of the building code in France, so this is quite convincing. But this is not uh, my work, you know. I um, I I I don't do the same work as an intellectual or people that dressed in black. But you know, we you're dressed in black, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. So, you know, I <laughs> maybe the white I shoes, maybe. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I try to fit the standards, you know, as much as possible. So. No, no, we're all the, on, on the same team, you know, but my work is artistic, you know, I'm showing uh, beautiful stuff. This is the second criteria people are using before, you know, for choosing building materials, the aesthetic. So performance is aesthetic. That's about what they're looking for. Sustain sustainability is something just interesting. It's not so much into decision making. It's, it's important, but you know, if it was really important, we would have solved problems. You know, we would have solved the climate change. So that's why we Working try on to. It. Yeah, yeah. That's why we're making this. Uh, that's why we're making sustainable solution pretty. You know, it's. It's all important. It, yeah, very important. Right. And I th yeah, I think the uh, uh, you know the importance of codifying and standardizing too, so that um, so that these technologies can scale is a, a key point. 
Um, I do just want to make one announcement in closing. Um, Martha Lewis, right here, uh, next to me on stage, uh, just won the 2019 Person Prize by the Sustainable Element at the recent Building Green Conference in Copenhagen, which is a really big deal. Late breaking news. <laughs> um, but we have some uh, really kind of stellar uh, people across the board up here on stage. So uh, everybody give everybody a hand, please. Thank you.